Hello there, fellow Rotarians. Uh, thank you. That was a uh, a son harocho. It's a fusion of uh, Andalusian, Canary Island, and African musical elements that uh, evolved out of Veracruz during the Spanish colonial times. I'll tell you more about it uh, later on since we got a little, started a little bit late. So since there's no December birthdays, let's go over to Dr. Karen Philbrick. Karen, are you with us? I am with you. Can everybody hear me okay? Sounds good. Awesome. Come on in. Well, thank you for the privilege of providing the inspiration today. I have selected a beautiful poem that was written in 2007 by Mrs. Raja Sinivasan when the theme was Rotary Shares and it was published in Rotary News. Where there is darkness, Rotary shares light. Where there is loneliness, Rotary shares love. Where there is illiteracy, Rotary shares education. And where there is ignorance, Rotary shares knowledge. Where there are problems, Rotary shares solutions. Where there is enmity, Rotary shares friendship. Where there are unearthed talents, Rotary shares opportunities. Where there are needs, Rotary shares new horizons of living. Where there is a tear, Rotary shares smiles. Where there is pain, Rotary shares the agony. But there, when there is gain, Rotary shares the joy. Where there are achievers, Rotary shares the compliments. And when there are failures, Rotary sh shares that loss. Where there are orphans, Rotary shares the family. Where there are elders, Rotary shares time. Where there is childhood, Rotary shares values of life. And where there is youth, Rotary shares the ladder, the ladder of leadership. Where there is unemployment, Rotary shares career choices. Where there is lack of awareness, Rotary shares vocational training. Where there is weakness, Rotary shares strength. When there is chaos, Rotary shares harmony. Where there is nothing, Rotary shares something. Where there is everything, Rotary sources it and shares it with those who have nothing. Thank you, my friends. May we continue to grow as Rotarians so that we stand in our community as a symbol of those willing to freely put service above self and make this our community and the world a better place to live. Happy holidays. Thank you, Dr. Philbrick. It reminded me of St. Francis of Assisi's prayer, but very beautiful. Now let me introduce Council Member Deb Davis, who is San Jose City Council, District 6. She was uh, re-elected to the second term in November, and for 12 years she was an education researcher at Stanford Center for Research on Education Outcomes. She was chair of San Jose's Early Care and Education Committee and has long been involved in community organizations. She has a bachelor's degree in economics and master's degrees in public policy and education policy organization leadership from Stanford. She and her family live here in North Willow Glen. So welcome, Deb. In seven minutes, please tell us all about your district and your challenges. You ready? Thank you, Fernando, for inviting me. Um, I do represent District 6. So I'm Deb Davis representing District 6 in the city of San Jose. And Fernando has a, a handy map there. It includes the Rose Garden, Willow Glen, and other wonderful neighborhoods, as you can see in uh, sort of central west San Jose. And I do appreciate being here. I do. I wanted to comment on the inspiration as well. I did notice it was a play on the, the prayer of St. Francis. And I am a member of St. Francis Episcopal Church, along with one of your other Rotarians, Pam Foley. And so I've known her for many years and I'm happy to be working with her on the council now. So I, I did just recently get reelected. I'm looking forward to taking the, the oath of office uh, for a second four-year term next week. For those of you who I don't know, um, I can just tell you a little bit about me. I am the mom of two teenage kids who have, uh, one's a freshman at Lincoln High School and the other one is a sophomore at Willow Glen High School. So they have different Zoom schedules. It's been very fun for my husband to have to keep up with that over the, oh, lions. 
this semester. All right, we've got a Lincoln Lion. No Rams? Come on. No, you got no a Bulldog Rams. over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, our family has three three uh, adopted dogs. They're all they're all shelter dogs. We like to say of the three dogs, we have one and a half Chihuahuas because each of them have half Chihuahua and half something else. Um, I my my husband is a creative person. He's had his own design firm um, for for many years, and he does both industrial product design as well as graphic design. So if you like my website, that's why he's always been in charge of those. And um, for those of you who don't know, I'm not a native Californian. I'm actually a native of North Dakota, born and raised there and very much grateful, especially at this time of year to be a Californian <laughs> and to enjoy our wonderful climate. It was, it was over, I think it was like 73 yesterday. And that's the, that's the time when I usually uh, gloat and call someone that I went to high school with who still lives in North Dakota, but they don't have snow right now, so it's not as fun. Um, I, I have a deep interest in health and helping our community live healthy lives. And, and this year has definitely put a fine point on that. So just working with, you know, as much as I can creating and supporting positive policies for the city of San Jose and for the for the betterment of the quality of life for all of our residents in San Jose. Um, in terms of what's happening in District 6, the, the biggest things, and I'm sure you've already gotten presentations about this, but the biggest things are the Google Campus and uh, the new Deardon station. So there's a whole station area plan and then there's also the Deardon integrated station concept uh, that's being planned right now. And I'm sure Rod Deardon Sr. has given you the big lowdown on that. We sh we're on a policy advisory board for, uh, for the joint Deardon station area through VTA. So those are, the, those are the big items. Of course, we also have in my district Valley Fair and Santana Row, and there's always extra development going on in both of those places, as I'm sure you are all aware. Um, so the, you know, the challenges for, for our district are really, especially around the, the Google and the Deardon area, maintaining that communication with all the surrounding neighborhoods and ensuring that as I see Rod's background is the historic Deardon station, um, ensuring that we, when we have construction that will go smoothly and that not only will, will we be able to preserve the historic station in some form somewhere, um, but also disturbing as little as possible what goes on at the SAP center, which is just outside my district, the border on um, the north end there is Santa Clara Street. So I have Deardon Station, but I don't have the SAP Center. So we really need to work together with the District 3 Council member, currently Raul Perales, to make sure all of this, all of this goes well and as smoothly as possible. Um, in terms of other, I think I have a few more minutes. Um, in terms of other important issues that we must tackle in, in my second term or in the next few years. Public safety issues are always a big, um, a big deal and always have been a big deal. And of course, with what's happened over, uh, over this summer, we, we really want to ensure that there are strong bonds between the community and the police department. To that end, I'm not sure how much you, you have been informed about this or are active in this, but we're working on um, reimagining policing and what that might look like in the future as we get a new chief. So we've focused on, on the police chief search for now. And then as the new chief comes on, we will be engaging the community across different um, community-based organizations, as well as just directly with the city staff on how we reimagine policing in um, in the city of San Jose, and we've we've got a really firm foundation there. Our police chief Eddie Garcia, who I think his last day is is this week. Um, I think Saturday is his last day, and he's really laid a good foundation for that with 21st century policing um, policies and with um, a new grant that we just received to enable. 
um, behavioral health specialists to pair with our police officers when they go to calls that are about mental health issues. So that's something that uh, was in the works for two years and we recently got that grant this fall. Um, one of the other items is really land use and where we put high density housing. Um, many of you may know there, there was a big uh, discussion in my district. I, I'm sure in district four as well during the, the um, campaign, excuse me, about opportunity housing and whether we change all of our single family neighborhoods to allow not just duplexes, but up to seven units on any single family home site or whether we focus on um, the, the areas that we've already designated for urban village plans for higher density. And that will be a question and a discussion that we have this spring um, as a community. And I'm seeing some, oh, I did see David Ginsburg say go Rams. All right. So I'm seeing some questions and I'm happy to, to get to those. Um, one question was, do I believe that the county's extremely conservative direction is balanced and fair for all concerned people and business? Isn't it safer and better for children to be allowed to participate in programs where all protocols can be followed and no virus spread occurs? I, this is about COVID. Um, I think that it's important to keep as many businesses open as possible. I think that's, we, we have already seen a lot of businesses go under. That's concerning to me. I do also think that um, having kids participating and moving, I have one who's been in soccer and one who has not been in, in a sport over this time period. And I will tell you the difference in, uh, in health already has been become for my two high schoolers very, um, very apparent. So I do think the physical activity for the kids outside is, is very important. And of course, we're blessed with that nice weather. So that's, that's one thing that I think is, um, is a little concerning about the most recent health order. Um, at the same time, I do think- 30 it's, seconds. 30 seconds. All right. Um, let me answer the other question. Is the city making a major push for the California Notify launch tomorrow? Yes, I believe we will be do we will be communicating that out quite broadly. I know I will be in my office. Wow, that seven minutes goes really fast. Blame that on Pam Foley. Um, thank you very much, Dev. Uh, appreciate your work. Next, we have Matt Breaker. He's a deputy DA and chair of the Culinary and Hospitality Committee with an update on next week's Mingle and Jingle. Are you there, Deputy Breaker? Yes, I am. Thank you, President Fernando, and hello to all my uh, Rotarian, fellow Rotarians and guests. Um, so yes, the Culinary and Hospitality Committee has been hosting a holiday luncheon since, well, forever, basically. And we have decided, uh, much to everyone's good news, I hope, that we're not going to let COVID and this year's pandemic uh, prevent us from celebrating our club and ushering in the holidays this year. So we have prepared a mingle and jingle event for the club, which is set for next week, uh, next Wednesday, the 16th. The culinary committee is putting together goodie bags for everyone to, uh, who's gonna be able to participate. Uh, and as a result of that, so we know who to get them to, we're asking everyone to sign up for the event. There's no cost, but we wanna know who's coming so we can get you a goodie bag. And, uh, if you're able to come to the Gordon House to pick it up on Monday between the hours of 10 and 2, there's a place when you sign up to say that, that would be very helpful. But if not, the committee will deliver it to your home. Uh, it's got some treats we've prepared for you. And also in there is uh, courtesy of the fabulous Bert George, a bottle of wine, which we know you'll enjoy and also will come in handy during a virtual wine tasting that we've got uh, scheduled as part of our activities for that day. Uh, we've also got some traditional uh, and Zoom friendly entertainment and games lined up, including among them is a uh, wear your favorite holiday hat competition. So if you've got one or you can order one, get one. Mine's en route from Amazon, but uh, it's going to be a fun event, uh, Zoom friendly. Uh, it's going to have all the traditional, we're going to have a little food, we're going to have a little, lot, little entertainment, and uh, we hope everyone can sign up and participate. And so all of those uh, who are uh, lighting their first uh, Hanukkah candle tomorrow night. Happy Hanukkah to you, and look forward to seeing everyone else uh, next week. Mazel tov, 
Maslow Kaufler, Matt, thank you very much. Um, by the way, you'll notice that the, at the close of this uh, program, uh, Zoom, you'll see uh, my uh, holiday hat on. Next, we have a uh, professor, retired professor from San Jose State, Tim Hegstrom. He's a member of our Rotary uh, San Jose State Committee with an update. I think he's going to tell us how the Spartans uh, won uh, five wins and zero losses, best record since 39. Come on in, uh, Professor. Are you there, Tim? The answer, thank you, President Fernando. And the answer to your question is the coaches finally listened to me. <laughs> Man, I really yeah. miss the in-person connection here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we do have a dozen members of the Rotary San Jose State Committee. And if we were in person, I know that there'd be a chorus of Go Spartans right now. Uh, President uh, Karen, last year noticing this, decided we should start a club focused on San Jose State. And President Fernando has actually uh, attended some of our meetings and shown great support. We, uh, at, when we're downtown at, at our regular uh, meeting center, we're in close proximity to the university and we have a number of alumni. So it makes sense for us to have a, a, a club, a committee to explore ways in which we can partner with the university. Our first leader was uh, Jason Alexander. Our current leaders are Mike Conniff and Edwin Tan. As captains, they, they picked an ordinary soldier to come give this report today, and I'm happy to do <laughs> it. We, um, we talked about a number of ways that uh, we have already made connections with the university. I know the book club has gone over and made a, had a tour of the, an art tour of the library. I know we've had several speakers from the university. I think the, uh, the golf club could put together a foursome that would join their annual uh, tournament there, et cetera. So there are possibilities, but we thought the best place to get started would be to make sure that we had a Rotaract club in place so that the students could participate in Rotary-like functions. And we were very lucky uh, through Jason's efforts, I think, to find uh, Dr. Elisa Mattarelli, who's a professor and associate dean of management, to be the advisor for this club. And she's here today with a number of the students, uh, President Fernando. And uh, so we, we welcome her and, and the leadership of this uh, Rotaract club with us today. The initial meeting of the club, there were 72 people who, uh, who did a Zoom meeting featuring Rotarian Randy Zekman on his topic, Entrepreneurship and Clean Energy. Uh, and then there were 10 in attendance for the, for the leadership meeting. And the previous slide was a screenshot of uh, some of the, the leadership that attended that meeting. Um, the, the next slide is some of their comments about why they wanted to be involved in Rotaract and uh, let me just read a few of these. Now I feel ready to take a more official leadership role and want to take part on something that help and improve someone else's life. Um, this one was uh, another one was a member of a Rotaract club in India and said, I organized several events and donation camps. Another one was in Interact through my time in Interact and the general Rotary family. I was able to learn so much. Uh, another one said, uh, this is my first year. I'd like to join in some groups and make friends and meet like-minded people. So we've got a good leadership core here for this, this group. And we're pleased that they're with us today. Uh, the possibilities, I think, are strong to provide service to the students and to provide a stepping stone to membership in our club. We're going to try to get them involved in as many of the club activities as is permissible. And finally, to make those good links between the Rotary Committees and San Jose State University departments. So thank you, President. This is, I think this is working out well to have a, a San Jose State University Committee. Well, thank you, Tim. That uh, is not the first time that we've tried this. Uh, of course, now we have uh, President Mary Tapazian as a Rotarian, so that should be of some great help to you. By the way, the district has a, Rotaract, a very active Rotaract effort and they have uh, people uh, at the district level, it could be of great help to you in setting up your Rotaract program. Um, also, don't forget that we need to support the International House. That was that's one of Rotary's um, 
prime uh, projects. And uh, we want to make sure that it continues and that uh, they continue to have that kind of uh, support for the international house. So thank you for a very fine report. Next, we've got uh, Suzanne St. John Crane and Jenny Nicklaus. Both are with American Leadership Forum and they both are on the program committee who apparently want to ring the bell. Hey, come on in, hey. guys. Thanks, President Fernando. Great to be here. Great to see, see you all, fellow Rotarians. Suzanne St. John Crane, CEO of ALF and your program committee chair this year. And just thrilled to announce uh, in our ring the bell moment here that ALF is uh, started uh, a new initiative called ALF Insights, facilitation and convening the ALF way. It's really formalizing something that ALF's been doing for many, many years now. So beyond our fellows program, we're also having or helping people have difficult conversations. And Jenny Nicholas is leading it. Jenny. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all today, um, even though it's virtual. And really what our work is with ALF Insights is to emerge and build the dialogue with those we're working with. And really what we're here to do is we're committed to bringing groups of people together in spaces of productive tension in order to build deeper relationships that can lead to the creation of powerful community impact. And we're doing it every day. Um, and so we're happy to ring the bell today in celebration of formalizing this great work. And y'all know where to reach me if you have more questions. So blessings to y'all for the holiday season. Thank you. Happy holidays. How many bells, ladies? We're gonna do one bell for now. <laughs> ring it. Come on. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hey, listen, we want the rest of you out there to keep in mind, you've got some good news out there. And that's what this is all about, a fine opportunity to share your good news with us as you help us raise funds for our committees through our Rotary Foundation. So thank you. Uh, it's my uh, president's time right now. Um, Rotary International Conference in Taipei. There's an early discount registration which has been extended to February 15th next year for that meeting that's taking place in Taipei on June 12th through the 16th. Now, we should have been all vaccinated by then, and let's see how this uh, rolls out. Sometime uh, later in January, I think the Rotary International is gonna make a decision whether it's going to be a virtual or a hybrid or an in-person sort of uh, conference. So look for that. And here's some very welcome news for many of our members. Although the district can't pay for your club membership dues, the Rotary District will assist members in paying for their district and or their Rotary International dues for Jan January to July of next year for Rotarians who might be having financial difficulties because of COVID-19 lockdown. So you wanna contact uh, our executive director, Leslie Hamilton. So now we've got Gay Crawford, who's a co-founder in Cancer Care Point. She's on the program committee and is our fine announcer. She's going to introduce today's speaker, Gay. Hey, thank you, President Fernando. Well, what does it take to raise successful people? Esther Wuchitsky, lovingly referred to as the godmother of Silicon Valley, has a simple answer to this million dollar question. She's going to share with us her trick an acronym which she discusses in her brand new book, How to Raise Successful People, Simple Lessons for Radical Results. An earlier book was Moonshots in Education. Dr. Wozitski is a revered high school teacher in the media arts program she founded at Palo Alto High School where she has taught since 1984. She is a pioneer in the integration of technology into the classroom been a frequent blogger for the Huffington Post. She and her husband, professor of physics, have three daughters, Susan, the CEO of YouTube, Janet, a professor of pediatrics at UCSF Medical School, and Anne, one of the co-founders of 23andMe. She has a very impressive biography on Wikipedia. I encourage you to look at it and read her book. And special thanks to Lena Broido, who uh, is the Los Altos Rotarian, and she helped engage Esther to come to us today. So please give a warm welcome to Esker Wuchitsky, American journalist, innovator, educator, blogger. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I am very happy with this wonderful introduction. Thank you, Gay. And thank you, Lena, for suggesting that I be a speaker. I'm really honored. I, I love what the Rotarians do, and I've loved the Rotary Club since I was in high school. And there was a local Rotary Club that was a very important part of the high school there where I went in Los Angeles. So I will share my presentation now with you. And uh, that is if I can figure out how to do it, which I think I can. And um, so here it is, the future of education, the impact of COVID on the education. So there are five principles for education today. That's in my opinion, of course. Uh, I can be disputed later. <laughs> um, and it's TRIC. I developed this acronym to help people remember what I thought was important in my book. And my book is actually organized around this acronym TRIC. And um, these principles are even more important in today's online learning. And you will see why, because this is what it stands for. Trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. And honestly, I think this goes along really well with what Rotarians believe. Um, because the first thing you wanna do is trust as a parent, trust your child to do things independently, respect their ideas, no matter how wacky they are. And I know they're pretty wacky give them a lot of independence, collaborate and don't dictate, and then treat them with kindness. So this is what I did in the classroom. And this is what I did in my parenting. And this is what my book says. And this is from Ariana Huffington. And she says that I'm leading a revolution. And I am trying really hard to do that. I'm trying to change the way we teach in the schools. And I see this pandemic, um, there's many ways to see the pandemic. Of course, it's terrible. And we've all had a lot of problems, uh, illness and job loss and home loss and income loss. But on the brighter side, you can take a look at the fact that it's disrupted a system that needed to be disrupted. And that's our education system. So we need to trust our children, our students and our colleagues, because when you trust people, they trust and believe in themselves. And that's one of the things that is really hard for kids to do with the present system. They never think that they're right. They never think that whatever they think or do is right. Because what we do as teachers, as we have a defined curriculum, you memorize it, you take a test on it, and then you learn it, or supposedly learn it. And if you didn't do well on the test, well, then you don't feel very good about yourself. And a lot of people don't feel very good about themselves. So as I said, this pandemic offers the opportunity for what I call independent online learning. So this new model is self-directed learning. And I didn't ask for this, but I think the Zoom calls help with that. That is, if you give students an opportunity to be in charge of what they're learning, at least to some percentage, at some percentage. And I have this philosophy that if you give them just 20% of the time to be in charge of their learning, it will make a big difference. And 80% of the time you can continue to have the same curriculum. But right now the curriculum, 100% of the curriculum is determined by, first of all, by the state, then by the school board, then by the superintendent, then by the principal, and then it goes down to the teacher. And then you wonder why teachers, you know, don't have any control in the classroom or any creativity in the classroom is because they are told what to teach all the time. There's very little leniency, very little opportunity for them to be, so to speak, creative. 
So if we trust them to be self-learners, then you are preparing them for the 21st century. And I'll give you why. So self-learning, first of all, it empowers the learner because you have to find a lot of the information yourself. That mean, doesn't mean that I'm eliminating the teacher. I'm just putting the teacher in the role of a guide, a coach. It encourages curiosity. It encourages creativity because you find other things when you're looking around for what you're supposed to be studying. It's much more engaging and it prepares you for the real world. So right now in the real world, People are working much more independently. We're all working from home. And we all have one of these in our pocket. Every single, as some people have two. And I've even seen people with three. I don't know how they do that. So independent learning prepares kids for the work world today. Here's this. From Stanford Advocate, this is Stanford <clears throat> publication. How remote work will transform the innovation landscape and establish a new kind of entrepreneur. And it will, remote work is changing everything. And um, we need to be prepared for it. So remote work requires much more self-monitoring and as a result, it requires more trust because you, know, you cannot monitor your employee the same way you might have been able to do it when they were all in one location. You have to trust them. And if you don't, well, it's not going to work. It also requires more respect, respect for them as human beings, respect for their needs, respect for them and the problems that they're going through today. We're all going through these problems. So this is Siemens in Germany announced a new company, announced a new policy, new company structure. And Inc, the magazine reported about it, required new two sentence remote work policy is the best I've ever heard. This came out just um, recently. And this is the Siemens policy. They focus on outcomes, not hours, and they trust and empower the employees. That's it. So they are not micromanaging anymore. So if you have students that are used to being the CEO of their own learning, they're going to fit much more effectively into this new way of, of the companies are working because Siemens is a leader in Germany. It's one of the largest companies and other companies follow. So here I personally am connected in some way with these two companies and I can tell you that they're doing the same thing. 23andMe and Google, they respect their employees, they trust them, they give them a lot of independence. They the whole company is based on collaboration, all of them, and they treat them with kindness. So there are many opportunities for self-learning for everybody, not just employees for everybody and not just kids. Coursera, Coursera, Udemy, Udacity, edX. This is for adults or this is for high school students. And Coursera, Coursera that had the first four years of its existence was not a very successful company. Apparently now in the pandemic seems to be doing really well. And um, they are an online learning platform out of Stanford and edX is an online learning platform out of Harvard. Uh, Udacity is a private company that has the most amazing platform where if you take their courses by yourself or with a friend um, and you pay the tuition, which is not, a, not inexpensive, if you don't get a job at the end of that, they'll give you all your money back. So for kids age two to seven, you know, there's a lot of stuff on Khan Academy, which I'm sure you've heard about. They can learn all kinds of interesting things related to, well, games and movies and math and reading and things like that. And YouTube Kids also has a lot of things and it's all curated for kids. And now I'm going to tell you about a new platform that I'm involved in, Tracked. 
for kids eight to 14. And what I did after I um, retired in June, because I saw this coming, um, I worked with my former students, these people at the bottom of the screen, there's a lot of them that it scrolls through our former students or present students um, to set up this opportunity for kids to learn things that they care about. And it's a peer to peer community where kids get to discover their new interests. And um, they, the, all these learning opportunities are created by teenagers. Um, they're my students that are between the ages of 15 and 20 or maybe 22. And the, it's targeting kids eight to 14 so that they can have a really exciting uh, time learning something that might be really different, something that they can't find in school. There's subjects that you can't find. So how to bake the ultimate chocolate chip cookie is one, how to make a trailer for your life. I mean, there's hundreds of these, it's just four. Black holes, the universe's vacuum cleaners, Pokemon plant and animal biology. These are all created by teenagers. So this also gives me an opportunity to celebrate teens because I think there's not very many opportunities to do that these days anywhere. So this is what we're doing. This is featuring and promoting talented teens. This is an upcoming live stream on Track Live. I'd like to invite you to join. And this is a 12 year old who is the CEO of her own company. Her name is Samira Menta and she started a company. I swear, I guess she was 10, I don't know. But anyway, this is the new world. And so I, I think it's an interesting opportunity for people to see how kids can be educated in a more effective way. So um, the name of her company is Coder Bunnies. Of course, this is a name I never would have thought of ever. And she's teaching other kids how to code. And she's like 12. Well, I think, yeah, she's 12. Look at that. There's a com gonna be in conversation with another student who is 15. So my goal is to teach them to think about the community, not just themselves. And COVID-19 is the perfect time to do that. We all need to take care of each other. We need to work together as a team in so many ways. And this is, it starts at home. It continues through the schools and hopefully it's all part of the adult community and the Rotary Club does a great job. So kindness, teach them kindness by modeling it yourself. It's a high stress moment for the world and we all need to be kind to each other. So my ideas about teaching started with the birth of my daughters. Everybody wants to know, what did you do with your daughters? What did you feed them for breakfast? <laughs> anyway, I'll just tell you, here's my three daughters when they, we lived in Geneva, Switzerland for a few years and here they are. They look a little shocked. Well, two of them, one of them does. And that's because no one prepared them for this picture, which was taken in a shopping mall by a shop, by a photographer there. Here they are today. This is at the Breakthrough Prizes, which you might've heard about. They're held in Mountain View once a year. And um, this year, of course, it was all remote, but we hope next year we'll be back to normal. This is Susan who is navigating a very difficult situation at YouTube because you know YouTube is at the center of a lot of controversial videos that people people put up people put them up you know on first on either the right side or the left side or whatever and then they all get mad you know it's like it's no way to make the, everybody happy it's kind of like whack-a-mole you know when you make one happy you make the other one not so happy this is Janet, professor of pediatrics at UCSF. Her focus is the obesity epidemic and she's an epidemiologist. And so she's working really hard with young mothers to make sure that they're feeding their children right so they get lifelong habits that are going to serve them well. 
This is Anne. She's the co-founder and the CEO of 23andMe, the largest personal genetics company. And what she's doing with that that you might be interested in is checking to see if your DNA has a way that predisposes you to a more um, difficult course if you have COVID. So the question is, why are some people getting really sick? and other people just sneeze a few times. So she's working on the answer to that. And um, so, um, you know, if you haven't done 23andMe as a yourself, you might wanna do it. It's, they're doing a sale right now. I think it's $79 and it's normally, um, I think 200 or something like that. Um, so what did I teach them? It's okay to take a risk and not succeed. I, they were always able to try out new things not be afraid of failure, just do it again. And that's exactly what I taught my students in my classes. I always provided a safe space to be creative and I was always kind. Kindness goes a long way. I taught them to believe in themselves by trusting them. I trusted them. And by trusting them, they then trust themselves. A lot of adults don't trust themselves. I taught them to improve the world, work to make the world a better place. Again, always think about community. No one can control life, but you can control your reaction to life. Always look for the good. So this is when you can't control what's happening. Challenge yourself to control the way you respond to what's happening. That's where your power is. And that especially applies to today why do people react differently when confronting the same threat? In the face of coronavirus, some people collect household goods. Others ignored the warning altogether. Two Penn researchers explain why both responses are normal. People, it is crazy what people are doing, but you personally have the power to respond. And this is, as you recall, how a lot of people responded. I don't know how a pile of toilet paper is gonna make me feel better, but you know, there was no toilet paper at Costco or anywhere for a while. <laughs> so number one way to cope, maintain connections with people important to you, even if it is virtual. Schedule these interactions because it's so important to maintain these connections. So my pedagogy and philosophy continued with the birth of my media arts program. I started that in 1984 with 20 students on a typewriter using X-Acto knives. I handed out hundreds of knives, hot wax and paste up. Today I would be arrested for handing out knives. I was in this portable for 30 years at Palo Alto High School. As the program grew, they added more portables. So the program was built on this philosophy that I talked about earlier, trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. That's the key. Today, it's the largest media program in the US, 10 publications, actually almost 800 students, six media arts teachers, and wins top of the nation awards. I moved from the portable to this incredible building, 25,000 square foot media arts center. This is the kind of work my students produce. They're still doing it now in the pandemic. Um, these papers, uh, this front page of the paper, they're usually 24 to 28 pages long, three sections. This is a magazine still publishing called C Magazine. So why do kids want to work that hard? Why do they want to do this? It's the whole trick philosophy. They own it. They own the publication. It's all their ideas. Here's another one. Everything they write about is what they want to write about, not what I want to write about. I just make sure that they don't ever violate any of the press codes and that everything is always double checked for accuracy. This is a um, sports magazine. And I'll tell you, everybody loves this because all the grandparents want it, all the kids want it, all, everybody wants it. So students, students are still publishing from home. Of course, the sports magazine is on a break because we don't have any sports um, in the midst of the pandemic. And how are they doing that? So I just came up with this last spring. Instead of me being in charge of the Zoom call, I put the kids in charge of the Zoom call. 
let me just tell you, they all show up. Mm -hmm. They all want to be there because they're in charge. They take turns. So one thing is really important for people to realize, and I think it's especially important in this pandemic, is that people make a lot of mistakes before they reach their goal. A lot of mistakes. And, you know, that's just the way the world is. And I can just tell you my three daughters and the kinds of crazy things that they did before they got to where they are. You just have to believe in them and give them the opportunity to live their lives and stop telling them all the time what to do. So this is uh, my New Yorker car cartoon to sum it all up. It's always sit, stay, heal. Never think, innovate, be yourself. So we want it to be think, innovate, and be yourself, not sit, stay, and heal. So now I'll be happy to take any questions from anybody. Oh. Esther, that was outstanding. A lot of really, really good information. And there are lots of questions in our chat. I I'm glad you talked about the kids because there are a couple. In fact, Judge Weisbrot uh, had three or four questions. Um, not only did they go to traditional schools, people are asking about athletics, were those important? And also your husband's role and what he did. Maybe we could start with that question. So my husband is professor of physics at Stanford University. And his role, he really played a very big role because, you know, whenever the girls would say something, he would say, can you prove it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's your typical scientist, prove it. And, you know, that was really helpful because, you know, they had to be able to prove what they said. Otherwise, um, they wouldn't, you know, it didn't make any difference to him. He wouldn't listen. So that's my husband's role. And he still plays a very important role. You know, he loves history. He loves politics. He loves listening to music. So, you know, he's transferred all that to his grandchildren. By the way, we have 10. And there were a couple of questions about the digital divide and also East Palo Alto, whether they may have some program similar to what you have created this fabulous program in Palo Alto. Well, so East Palo Alto, one of my students was teaching in East Palo Alto. Um, and then I guess they had, I don't know, they had a shortage of funds or something, but then they, um, they changed. But they did have a program there last year where they were doing a, a journalism program like this. I would love to see more of this. I would love to see all kids have this opportunity. And that is part of the reason I created this tract because we're gonna give kids that opportunity to work together collaboratively. We haven't, we're, haven't yet built it in, but we're going to, that they will be able to develop and publish on tract and you know have newsletters that go out. I just think that if we respect their ideas and give them more of an opportunity to do things that they care about, it will make a huge difference um, in their lives. And uh, Dr. Roman just asked, do you have any similar resources in Spanish? Oh, we're, this is gonna be international. We're doing it internationally. So the next language we're doing is Spanish. And um, actually they're also gonna be, they're gonna be doing it in all over Europe, German and France, France as well. So, I mean, we, we literally just got started to do this. Um, we started first in June of this year with just an idea. We launched at the end of October. So we literally have been going for like, what, six weeks, something like that. But we always already have a lot of interest and a lot of people that uh, would like to, to help. So if you're interested, um, you could send me a message at hello at track.app and we will respond. We'd love to have your input or any guidance or if you want to volunteer or, you know, if you have kids, you know, that might be interested. You know, we're charging $20 a month for this and mm -hmm. one membership um, also provides a membership to a family that can't afford it. So it's two for one for 20. Oh. And, um, and so far, it's, it's pretty amazing what the, what the kids can do and the, the fact that so many kids like doing this and it's actually really learning. But 
they think it's a game. That's good. That's okay with me, by the way. Well, and I'll ask maybe a couple more questions. And I know Fernando would always invite you if you're able to stay afterwards, people might pose some of them. But there was a question. I think you're dealing with eight-year-olds. Eight to 14-year-olds. Eight to yeah. 14. So the question about when can they be their own CEO? And then what's the consequence of violating or breaking that trust? How do you deal with that? So, you know, I always, so as a teacher for 40 years, you can imagine there was a, there were a lot of situations where kids didn't follow what they said they were going to do who violated the trust. You know, what I always did and it worked, it, it never didn't work. Let's put it that way. It always was effective. <laughs> they always had to stay after school with me, talk about what they did, and then write an essay I swear, you know, writing an essay makes them think about what they did, whatever it was. I mean, I had, I cannot tell you lots of, you know, things that you probably um, would think were, were bad. But, you know, it provided a sense of a relationship between me and the kids and the fact that, you know, I understood them. I can tell you something else that I did that probably would shock you all. I took for 16 years, I took 50 kids to New York City for a week. And um, well, they're actually 52, to be honest, because I put four in a room. And so it had to be in groups of four. And, you know, they always did what they said they were going to do because all these kids had been with me, before, you know, they started in the 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. So they knew what were the expectations and they never ever violated my trust which was I mean it's it's kind of remarkable in today's world but I think that if you understand them and they know you understand them they will then uh, you know follow the agreed upon plan whatever it is and then your thoughts, I think I mentioned the digital divide couple on that and lack of broadband access in poor rural communities. Um, I mean, online learning is incredible if you have access. So how do we shift policies for these? So uh, that is the biggest problem I see the country facing mm. because I think that the government should be responsible for making sure that everybody has access to some kind of online, to, to to anything digital, to the Wi-Fi, you know, to the internet. Um, and, you know, I would say, I forgot what the percentage is, I'm sorry, but I think it was about 80% of the population does have access, but there's that 20% that doesn't. And yeah. those kids, I mean, it is terrible. We should do whatever we can to make that change. You know, especially now in this pandemic, can you imagine how your life would be if you could not mm -hmm. access the internet, if you could not watch TV, you know, or you could not do Netflix? Can you imagine just staying home all day, every day, doing nothing? I mean, it sounds like a nightmare to me, but uh, I mean, we're, we're all blessed that at least we have the internet, you know, we can do Zoom calls, we can watch movies, you know, we can talk to our friends on Zoom calls. Um, and what happens if you live in a place where you, you don't have it or your parents don't have it? There, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of money. I know my daughter personally went and handed out um, free meals to people in East Palo Alto just a few days ago. Um, well, it's great to, to do that. I, I mean, I think that's really important too. But I mean, we need to give these people tools to be able to do things themselves. You know, it's that story of the fisherman, you can teach a man to fish or you can give him fish, right? Better to teach him to fish. And so if we can empower people, make sure they have access to the web we are doing much more than we could do any other way. And so, yes, I'm, that's, I'm on that bandwagon. You wanna help, I'd be happy to take any help. That was from Suzanne at ALF. So I bet you'll hear from her. And, and maybe one last one, Fernando, is this okay? Arthur Weiss posted, I think, three or four <laughs> questions. He wants to know, did you discipline your children when they were one? Did they have chores? Did you employ any punishments at all? 
So I did discipline, I did discipline them when they had, when they were, you know, when they misbehaved. And my discipline was very similar to what I did in the classroom, which is, again, I talked to them and had them, when they were little, they had to draw pictures, okay? As they got older, they had to write about it. Um, but, you know, I always tried to make them understand my thinking. It was never, you just have to listen to me because I said you're doing it, except for things like, um, you know, you can't run out in the street because there's a car there, you know, there if it was a dangerous situation, it was different. Um, I think my philosophy can be seen, you know, I taught my daughters to swim very early. I mean, it must have been 12 months, 14 months old, because I had a swimming pool in the, in the backyard, and I didn't want them to fall in. I didn't want to be a statistic. And um, so I always tried to make them understand so that then they would follow whatever it was the rules and I think that when kids when they don't think they're heard that's when I think you run into the problems mm -hmm. um and as far as yes they we had to stay in the room if they were really bad naughty and um I don't know when they got to be teen that the biggest problem is when they're teenagers and they don't do what they're supposed to do mm -hmm. um then that's harder for you but then as far as chores go you know I didn't, I didn't actually make it into chores. I was like, hey, you live in this house too. We all live here together. I'm doing it too. So you're part of the team. And my daughter, Anne, was, the, was in charge of ironing. It was so funny, you know, and she would sit in front of the TV with an ironing board and an iron and she would iron everybody's clothes. And one, one day, one of the boys from across the street came across, said to me, are you trying to teach her to be a, a housewife and a maid? Because what, what are you doing making her do all the ironing? And it's like, well, if she doesn't do it anyway. So I just thought you should know they all did everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was outstanding. And, and if you just finish maybe telling your- hey, let, me, let me interrupt just a second. Yes. I'm going to ask, uh, Esther, are you available to stay a little bit after 1.15 to say one third? 130? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, let me then interrupt and say thank you very much for this very informational and very uh, uh, useful uh, program that you've given us. Uh, a contribution has been contribution has been made on your behalf and on behalf of all of our program speakers uh, who come to talk to us. And we give it to our Fire City Forest, a nonprofit which will plant. 30, 46 shade trees out in East San Jose to combat heat islands and climate change and improve our neighborhoods uh, while providing a habitat for birds and other wildlife. So be sure to give us your mailing address where I can send you a thank you card. Um, okay, I will. That, okay, and as uh, you've heard, next week is our Rotary Holiday event. You heard Matt Breaker talk about it. There will be no program speaker because the Culinary and Hospitality Committee has a wonderful mingle and jingle program um, planned for you. So be sure to register with Matt Breaker. Tell him where you want your goodie bag delivered and it'll bring come with a Burt George bottle of fine wine, which we'll taste next Wednesday. So be sure to register with them and tune in and zoom in to uh, next week. So to paraphrase my favorite immigrant governor, hasta la vista Rotarians, the Zoom meeting is formally stands adjourned but back to our program speaker. Esther, take it away. Hasta la vista. Okay. Well, thank I'll you. Just, uh, and thank you. It really was informative. Esther, maybe before we open it up and we'll let people ask you questions directly, could you tell them a little bit about your, your story? Because uh, how you grew up and how you came, um, I mean, to have this fabulous education but you were the first one in your family to go to college. Is that right? Right. So um, yes, I, my, my parents immigrated to the United States. So I'm first generation. Uh, they came from, my mother was from Siberia and my father was from the Ukraine. And my father was an artist. And as you might recall, artists don't generally make very much money. So we were poor all the time. And um and so I grew up in a very um, sort of 
you know, difficult environment. It was difficult also because, you know, it was culturally difficult. And, you know, being an immigrant means you don't understand really what's going on in the world and around you and don't understand um, that what's, what the rules might be. Um, my education was at a public school in Los Angeles. That was the elementary education. And my high school was very similar. Um, also elementary educa secondary education in Los Angeles. Um, it was a tragedy that happened in my life when I was 10 um, that really just changed my attitude toward everything. And that is I had a younger brother age 18 months who swallowed some aspirin while he was playing on the floor. Mm. And my mother um, called the doctor and somehow rather did, he didn't either listen or I don't know what his problem was, but he gave her the wrong advice. He told her to put him to bed and see how he was in a few hours. And um, of course you never do that with a child that ingests a poison. So um, he uh, was violently ill and then my mother took him to my, she listened to him because she was an immigrant. Again, one of those things where, you know, you don't understand the culture and you believe what people with a long title wow. say. Thank you. So she didn't believe, so she went to the hot community hospital where they pumped his stomach, but wouldn't keep him. And so to make a really long story short, it's in the book actually, um, you know, he, he died. And um, what happened to me is that I realized that I couldn't trust people no matter whether they had long titles after their name or not. I always had to double check to make sure in fact that what they said and the advice they gave was something I could believe. I did not, was not on the conscious level. This just was subconscious, you know? And then as I went through school, um, I suddenly realized I had to learn as much as I could. I became a big reader and I ended up by not, I wasn't targeting this, but I ended up being the class valedictorian for a very large class. And it was, I guess, because I was doing, I was just so bent on learning. And then I went to college, of course, at Berkeley, I got a scholarship to the University of California and um, the, the motivation was always education. If I knew more, I could always protect myself and I could protect my family and so forth. And then I thought to myself, well, all kids need this. Everyone needs it. And uh, I first went into journalism because I thought, well, you know, I can write stories about people that are, that don't have a voice and I can give them a voice. But then I decided to be a journalism teacher and the, my goal in doing all that was never really to produce a lot of journalists, but to produce people that can think and who have all the skills I talk about, you know, compassion and empathy and, you know, be able to think critically and be able to communicate effectively. And so um, it all stems back to this childhood that I had and the fact that I wanted to make sure that everybody everybody that I came in contact with would have a better better life. Thank you for sharing that, that is great. Well, okay, Rotarians, if you can ask a brief question, it sounds like we have another 10 minutes or so. Right. I'm well, if no one's asking the question, I'll ask it. I, I, it seems to me that uh, we have these uh, special education programs like Oh, Chicano history or uh, Asian history or black history. See, it's because we don't teach history the way it occurs. We teach it the way it's determined, I think, with political considerations. Any chance that anyone's going to listen to uh, you and see if we can begin to teach history the way it occurred so we don't have to have all these special programs? Well, I'm working on it, to be honest. <laughs> I'm trying to change the system and um, change the way that, you know, actually history, oh my God, it gets to be so crazy and so political and uh, really is a problem. And so what I always do and the way I always talk, cause I did teach history at one point is I always said 
let's look at what's going on in the world today and see whether you can understand the historical roots that caused that kind of behavior. Where did it come from and why are people behaving that way? You know, interestingly enough, kids loved that and they hated memorizing dates. And I was like, memorizing dates is ridiculous. We don't need to do that. You just need to have a concept, you know, a general idea of when this took place. So, um, you know, even in this different states, like for example, in Texas, there was a whole group of, I mean, thousands of textbooks that were discarded because they somebody had put some historical fact in that the legislature didn't like. And they just threw away the books, all of them. So I think it'd be great if people could be a little bit more understanding and tolerant of each other. And if we could all under, could all work together where we everybody wants their children to be successful. We all want to ha live a good life, have food, have clothing, have, you know, a car, money to some money. You don't have to have a, you know, a lot of money, but enough money to be able to enjoy extras in life. Um, I'm, I'm working on changing the system because one of the biggest problems happening in the pandemic right now is about 40% of the kids are not logging on at all. No education, nothing. And we need to make it much more engaging, which is why I started this track thing because um, you know I want them, they, they can learn while they're having fun. And so um, that's what I'm hoping will happen. Astrid, thank you so uh, much. I have a question we have well, can raise I ask your hand and we'll <laughs> call on oh, you oh sorry i didn't yeah. know we were doing it that way yeah i think we just decided suzanne go ahead okay sorry if that was carmen if i cut you off I mean, <laughs> esther thank you so much that was just great and i've got two daughters uh 13 and 16 and they both have add or adhd mm -hmm. and instead of feeling like it's a superpower uh, they feel like they are different and just can't conform to the public school or private school, any school type classroom. So I'm just wondering if you, I mean, more and more kids are getting diagnosed with this and having attention deficit challenges. Uh, I'm curious what you think about it, how, you know, advice for me, I'd love to, to hear your reflections on that. Thanks. So thank you. Um, I think the reason that more and more schools, more and more people are being di diagnosed, more and more kids is because the school, I'm sorry to say this, but I think the schools are asking things of the kids that are just not reasonable. You cannot sit there for seven hours in a row and just be happy doing that. Nobody can. And a matter, as a matter of fact, even you at this age, you would find that very unpleasant to do. So why do we ask kids to do that? And what do we do? We drug them so that they can sit there half drugged and and do and sit quietly while the teacher does Preach it. Well, it. I never Preach did that it. at all. I can tell you what I did. Kids that were really over energetic, I had in the classroom. It sounds crazy, but it worked. Exercise bikes. They didn't make a lot of noise. But they, you, the kid could hop on if they felt like that. And there were like kids that were on the bikes all the time and then they could listen. They just have too much energy. And so I don't believe in drugging them. I'm sorry, you know, it's just not. I think that those are very creative kids. Your kids, I'm sure, are creative. They play and I would. Yes, they paint, they do all that, but they can't get into college probably, right? Oh, not they, way to don't leave. even worry about that. You know, they not, will you know get what I'm in. saying? It's like, that's what we're hearing is like, they have to conform. They have to be able to pass, you know, do this work by this time. So I've been navigating it for years, but I appreciate, yeah, my daughter sits on a yoga ball. She gets to chew gum in class, you know, we're trying everything. So thank yes, you. Yes, she should. And by the way, you know, the most creative person on the planet right now, the guy in charge of Tesla, he was ADD too, in case you wanted to know. And yeah. you can still see it today. So <laughs> I think we need to appreciate those people and stop restricting them. Judge Weisbrot, you had a bucket load of questions. Would you like to uh, <laughs> pick one of them? 
unmute. There he is. You know, we have five and six year olds who are on Zoom trying to learn. And it seems almost impossible for uh, kindergarten, first grade, and many second graders to follow a Zoom without a parent or other adult sitting there right there with them and helping them, which of course many parents can't do. So it's, uh, you've got a, a terrible problem, it seems to me, although online learning may be wonderful. Uh, how do you do that? And then since I have another question and that is how do you, if you've got a class of 35 kids, how do you empower each of them to participate in the curriculum? You've got, you've got, you know, you've got 35 different minds and 35 different uh, attitudes, and you want them all to participate in your 20% of the curriculum. How in the hell do you do that? Okay, well, that's, that's the question. The first question, the, the third, second one about 35 kids and how they do it. The first one was- um, Five and six-year-olds on Zoom. Yeah, five and six-year-olds on Zoom. Without a parent sitting there. Okay. So I, I think it is really difficult for that for five and six year olds to learn on Zoom. Okay, there's no question about it. And so what I would do is have the, the, there's too many Zoom, too many hours of Zoom calls. What I would do is have just a small amount of time on Zoom. Little kids just have to learn few things. They don't have to learn a lot. And then they would have, the best thing would be is if they could interact with each other. So I would have two kids at the same time watching some kind of a Zoom call. And then I would have them stop and play or, you know, there's all kinds of alphabet games. There's all kinds of number games. There's a lot of games that kids can do. Um, but you're talking about a parent being right there to participate, not one teacher for 35 kids at an elementary school by Zoom. You're talking about you right, being right, right there. Right. You're going, please, right. uh, you have to limit your questions because we have other people who have been waiting. Sure. Right. Okay, so it's really, it's tough to do. It's the, really the, the Zoom solution for little kids is not ideal. And I, I will just switch to the second question about like, how do you do it with all 35? Let me tell you, my classes at Palo Alto High School had 70 kids in it, one teacher and 70. So how did I do that with 70 kids? It's all peer-to-peer -peer learning. They were in groups, groups of four, and then they work as a team. And those team, kids learn the most from each other. All education studies show that 80% of the learning is done outside the classroom. So if you bring the outside into the class, and I brought the outside in by having them work in teams all the time, if you came to see that building that had 25,000 square feet in it, you'd say kids all over the place talking to each other, working in teams, and they were producing at the same time. So that's how you do it with older kids. You can do it with kids maybe the age of seven or eight. I think little kids five or six, it's much harder. But the main thing five-year-olds and six-year-olds are learning are social emotional skills. That's what they should learn. And there's a book that very famous book that came out a few years about all I ever learned or everything I learned that was important was in kindergarten or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, what they learned is social emotional. So that main thing I would do and I have a five-year-old granddaughter, I have multiple ones actually. <laughs> and what they do is that they have a little play group and the play group consists of three kids. All they need is one, to be honest, hmm. and then let them play. And I would give them games. I would show them how to play a game and then I'd let them play the game. And um, so I think the Zoom call, the only way the Zoom thing can work is if the teacher on that, it, that is doing the Zoom call directs the kids to do something at home in their environment and says, work together with your brother, your sister, or whatever. Otherwise, you're right. They can't learn it on a Zoom call. And, and so at 1.30, do you have time for one more question? 
One yeah. more question. Dr. Sure. Carmen Roman, uh, I was going to ask you and then Janica, but if we have time for one, Dr. Okay. Roman, what's your question? Um, how do you plan in your track up to include parents or to bring on board parents? Um, well, the, are they the, parents, the, the only way that parents are just vehicle ways to get the kids involved. It's not, so I, the tracked app, it's a way for kids to learn online. You, the, the videos that are being, that are used on tracked are either pulled from YouTube or the creators, the teenagers that are making it, make the videos themselves. Those are two different ways of doing it. And the idea is to have kids learn things that other kids want to learn. You know, instead of the stuff that the Board of Education is telling you to learn, it's like, hey, I want to know that too. And in doing that, you learn a lot of the other skills. I mean, one of the most important skills kids can learn is how to search intelligently on the web. That's the number one importance. I taught that. I mean, I was one of the only teachers in the school teaching it. It's like, whip out your phones. I'm going to show you how to find what you need to find on the phone. <laughs> you know, don't, because a lot of schools, they were confiscating the phone. Are you kidding? Huh? What a crazy thing to do. You know, you want those kids to know how to use the phone in an intelligent way. I mean, when you want information, you go on the phone, right? Well, why are we limiting kids? Hmm. So um, the parents... The only role the parents do is they can help the kids pick a course on tract or, you know, as I said, I, I have very, really amazing kids that are doing the creation on this program. So I don't know if you heard about the, I think I talked about the breakthrough prizes a little bit, the breakthrough prizes. Um, they have one kid per year that wins out of thousands wins the breakthrough prize um, in science, they create a video about a complex topic. And so my creators include the winners of the breakthrough prize and the winners of this breakthrough prize, you'll be shocked at what they get. They win $250,000 and then they win oh. another $100,000 for their school and another $50,000 for their teacher. And the total prize value is $400,000. So that's, those are these kids, these are the, the kids that I have on the website creating for the other kids. But I also have regular kids, you know, I just pulled them from my class. You know, they, they had nothing to do. And I was like, sure, come over here. I'll, you can, I'll teach you how to make, create, make uh, learning paths. So well, I hope that nice. helps. I would like, also would like to have Spanish speaking kids I am looking around for kids of all different ethnicities to help create learning paths. Well, we've got lots of people with lots of languages here. It's after it's 134. I think uh, we have our staff that has to get back to work. So thank you so much. It was just fabulous to listen to you and to learn the many things that you have uh, developed and discovered along the way. Uh, it's been proved by your children and certainly it's evidenced by the, this uh, program that you've got at, uh, at your school, the, the Media Arts Center that you had built, uh, fabulous stuff. Thank you very much. And I hope that uh, uh, you've enjoyed being here with us to present your information. I've enjoyed it so much. So thank you for this opportunity. And if you'd like to be in touch, you can send a message to hello at track.app and I'll try to answer your question. And Great. get all the best. Book. Keep get up our all book. The, yes, and get my book. Oh, yes. Get the book. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks. Terrific. Bye. Bye.